Article 100 definitions. When it comes to definitions, uh, obviously there are lots of things that we use as far as terms go uh, in the electrical trade. Some things are common, some things aren't so common. However, oftentimes the things that we're talking about may have a different meaning to us than what they mean in the code. So when it comes to Article 100, it is intended to give clarity to words that are fairly foundational or essential to understand uh, when interpreting the NEC, but it's not designed to include uh, definitions that are going to be for commonly used words, unless the commonly used word is one that's commonly misinterpreted or misused. If the NEC doesn't uh, define a term that you're looking for, well, it's okay to get that clarity from another code book or a dictionary or, or a trade book uh, of another sort that's going to be acceptable to your inspector. Now, this happens quite a bit. Not every definition is going to be in the electrical code uh, book, but you'll be able to find it somewhere. I'll give you an example uh, the difference between a dwelling unit bedroom or a sleeping room. Uh, those things can have distinct variances and you'll be able to find definitions to them uh, in several of the different books uh, but to narrow it down the sleeping room you're probably going to have to look in the building code. Accessible when you're talking about equipment. Allowing a close approach and generally not guarded by elevation, locked doors, or anything else. Accessible wiring methods. Not permanently closed in by the structure or the finish of the building and they can be taken down or removed uh, without damage to the structure. Readily accessible. This is a pretty common example. We see this often, not only in our houses, but also in laundromats and um, public use facilities in multifamily dwellings. You can see there's a plug-in right behind uh, that dryer. And in looking at that plug-in, do you feel that that would be readily accessible? In fact, looking at that uh, electrical panel over the top of the counter. Do you feel that that would be readily accessible? Code says in order to be readily accessible, it has to be capable of being reached quickly without climbing on or over obstacles for the purpose of inspection or energizing or de-energizing or for service. And one of the additions to the code in 2014 also says that you can't consider it readily accessible if tools are required to access it. If you've got a multifamily dwelling unit and your, uh, your equipment's located on the second floor, it can still be considered readily accessible as long as it meets these requirements. So it doesn't have to be on the ground level. Ampacity. Ampacity is the maximum current in amps that a conductor can carry continuously without exceeding its temperature rating for the application it's being used in. Appliance. Equipment other than industrial that is normally in standardized sizes that is designed to perform one or multiple functions. This could include a furnace, a stove, or a dryer. Approved. Acceptable to the authority having jurisdiction, usually the electrical inspector. And of course we abbreviate authority having jurisdiction with AHJ. Always discuss any changes or alterations or special methods with your AHJ.
Arc Fault Circuit Interrupter, or AFCI for short. A device that's intended to provide protection from the effects of arc faults. So what are those effects? Well, a lot of times it's going to be heat that will lead to fire. If the arc is recognized in the circuit and is de-energized, of course, it's going to get rid of that fire hazard. As we spoke about in several of the other chapters and several of the other courses, we got two things we're looking at here in the electrical code, two things that the code basically surrounds. Don't kill the electrician. Don't burn the house down. Hey, what makes an arc fault circuit interrupter diff different than just your regular run-of-the-mill three four dollar breaker? It has a chip. It has a chip inside of it that recognizes the characteristics of an arc fault. And we'll come back to that. Here's an actual arc fault breaker. Notice the neutral pigtail that comes off. The one thing that is different about an arc fault breaker from a normal breaker is both the hot and common will hook up to this breaker and then the, the uh, neutral will come right off of the breaker here with this pigtail to a neutral bar. Here are some other examples. Now in the clear example down here uh, in the middle bottom you can actually see the chip that's inside. Some of the guys will complain that uh, you get more neutral uh, tri or nuisance trips with an arc fault breaker. That's not necessarily the case as time goes on. The longer time goes on, people can turn in uh, problems that they're having with these breakers and they can program that into that chip and make it a normal scenario if they can reproduce it in a lab. Similar things have happened in the past with GFCIs. Attachment plug. A device, when inserted, inserted into a receptacle, establish a connection between the conductors of the attached flexible cord and the conductors connected permanently to the receptacle. bathroom. An area, not just a room, an area including a basin and one or more of the following. Could have a toilet. How about a urinal? Or a tub? Even a bidet has been added. bonded. Connecting conductive potentially current carrying objects together make sure that they don't uh, uh, have any difference in potential. Now when it comes to bonded, you know, grounding and bonding is a big section of the code book. Always remember Bonding is connecting stuff, whereas grounding is connecting to the earth. Here's some examples of bonding. Again, connecting conductive, potentially current carrying objects to make sure that you have good connectivity and conductivity. Notice the bonding wires going from one pipe to the other in both the copper on the left and the gas pipe on the right. Bonding conductor or jumper maintains electrical conductivity between metal parts of the electrical installation. Notice in the picture that we've got a jumper because it's it's possible uh, with the flexibility of that jumper it could go from one 
one spot to the next on just a regular stationary fixed in place device but you also could have something there that that may move a little bit it may shift expand contract uh, vibrate oftentimes you'll see that on devices that have a flexible uh, bonding jumper like that main bonding jumper connector that ensures continuity between the grounded circuit conductor and the equipment grounding conductor at the service. These could be a screw, a conductor, or a strap. How many are there on each system? Only one. That's why they call it the main. If you have more than one main bonding jumper, because you're connecting several panels uh, into one system, you'll need to disconnect all but one of those main jumpers so that you don't create a current on the metal parts. Branch circuit. Conductors between the final overcurrent device, like the breakers, and the outlets. This would start at the breaker and end wherever the loads connected. Multiwire branch circuit. A branch circuit with two or more ungrounded conductors having a voltage between them. Okay, here we got the red and the black. With an equal voltage being between the ungrounding conductors and the neutral conductor. So notice uh, in this particular example looks like we've got a 200, uh, 240 volt uh, breaker and with that we've got a hot leg coming off each side going to you know black one goes to two different uh, receptacles red one goes to one receptacle but they share a common or a neutral so the days of seeing this often are going to go by the wayside at some point at least for the time being uh, it's not frowned upon, it's not an illegal installation, but until we get under wraps the, um, the arc fault breakers and the GFCI breakers that need to be installed in many of the areas where these already exist, um, you're going to start to see them fall by the wayside, especially in the new construction. Existing homes, uh, they're there and they're probably not going to go anywhere for a while. However, the more you need to hook up the GFCIs and the arc fault breakers, the um, more you're going to see just regular single circuits like like is a traditional way. One of the advantages you get from a multi-wire branch circuit is obviously uh, as you can see from the example you would have the potential to use less wire and uh, you would also have the potential of running multiple circuits off of just one breaker so you can do a lot more stuff inside of that panel. However, the downfall on that is uh, what happens if they were to lose the neutral or possibly one of the um, hot legs. Now, if somebody comes along and takes off the neutral, which wouldn't make any sense, uh, obviously you would stand the chance of overamping everything else. Uh, so you could possibly create a circuit from the one hot leg completely through the loop to the other hot leg. Now you might ask yourself why in the world would we ever come along and just remove a neutral? That's an unlikely scenario. Most likely you would probably see the power utility lose a neutral. Maybe a lightning storm, maybe some kind of a surge or something like that. If the power utility loses their neutral, it would do virtually the same thing. Circuit breaker, a device designed to open and close manually at a set or predetermined amount of overcurrent without damaging itself. There's several kinds of breakers. There's adjustable, instantaneous, inverse time. Uh, each of these have different requirements as far as sizing them for the circuit and we'll talk about those in a later course.
clothes closet. A room intended for the storage of garments, it's not intentionally habitable. I'm not exactly sure how you would accidentally end up living in a closet or sleeping in a closet, but but I assume they wouldn't put it in the code book unless it's been an issue at some point. And if you look at the closet on the left, eh, that's probably bigger than uh, my family's first apartment. Communication equipment. Electronic communications equipment responsible for video, audio, and data transmission as well as the tech support equipment like laptops. It also includes the conductors used only for the equipment operation. So the, con uh, the conductors that you would use to tie the equipment together even though they don't go uh, to another device for origination and those would still be considered part of the communication equipment. Concealed. Wiring that is not accessible because of the structure or finish of the building. Now this brings uh, <laughs> uh, butterflies to my stomach every time I look at it. Now look at that plaster and lap board. Took some craftsmanship to make that stuff look great and it always does look great but boy they just don't build it like that anymore literally have you ever tried to take down plaster and lap board before Whew. damage would occur if repair or replacement were needed continuous load a load that's expected to draw maximum current for three hours or more controller a device that controls the electric power delivered to electrical equipment in a way that's predetermined oftentimes you're going to see a controller uh, that will be outside of the area where it's actually controlling the device or the motor uh, because you know oftentimes the area where that device is may be a hazardous location it may be um, a basic principle of wanting the on and off and actual control of the unit to be at a lower voltage than what the actual uh, fan or motor or device runs at normally. Um, maybe we don't want our guy out there pushing a button or turning a, uh, a switch that has 480 volts behind it. Uh, we would want something more manageable at a much smaller amount of power like in a controller. Device. Components of an electrical installation other than the conductors. Its intent is to carry electric energy. It includes receptacles, switches, breakers and fuses. All of these are devices. Dwelling unit must provide permanent fixed methods of living, sleeping, cooking, and sanitation. It's a single unit that has independent living facilities for one or more people. If there were more, we would call it a multifamily dwelling unit. Here are some examples. multifamily dwelling unit a building with all of the same requirements as a single dwelling unit but has three or more dwelling units in it apartments are a great example effective ground fault path a path designed to and intentionally installed to provide a low impedance path from a ground fault to the supply source in order to make sure the overcurrent device or ground fault detectors are able to remove the power as they're intended to do. What does that mean? What it, what what literally is an effective ground? Why do we got to say gr effective ground fault path instead of just calling it a ground fault path? A ground fault path 
is there just because. An effective ground fault path is one that you put there on purpose as part of your electrical system to make sure that a short that happens on the side of my house doesn't just sit there and energize the electrical parts outside, it actually will make it back to my breaker and trip the switch so that it cuts the power. It's one that's put there on purpose. That's the difference. Electric discharge lighting, EDLs. Lighting systems that utilize neon tubing or high intensity discharge lamps. Equipment. General term used to describe items used in electrical installations like machinery, luminaires, appliances, fittings, and devices. Exposed wiring method. On or attached to the surface or located behind access panels. Generally uh, speaking, this goes back to the term accessible when we talked about at the very beginning of the course. Uh, it can be removed without real damage to the structure. Feeder. Conductors between the service equipment or any other power supply and the final branch circuit over current device. Ground the earth. That's all we're talking about when we ground something, making a solid connection to the earth. So when you run grounding and bonding together, they don't mean the same thing. Bonding is connecting stuff, potential current carrying metal objects together. So they get rid of the potential difference between them and we minimize the risk of arcs and sparks ground is then taking the stuff that you've bonded together and connecting them to the earth. Grounded. Connected to the earth. Ground fault. An unintentional connection between an ungrounded conductor and the metal parts. This electrically conductive path forms by accident in normally non-conductive scenarios like contacting metal enclosures, non-current carrying conductors like the ground, or metal equipment. Ground Fault Circuit Interrupter, GFCI for short not to be confused with AFCI that we spoke about earlier. A device intended to protect people by de-energizing the circuit when the current to ground exceeds the value established for a class A device. Now remember the difference between this and an arc fault. An arc fault is trying to get rid of an arc, which generally is a small enough arc that could not create enough potential that it would make it back to the circuit breaker and trip the breaker, but it would create enough heat that it could start a fire. The GFCI is protecting people because it's checking the current going out and the current coming back to make sure that it's within a certain milliamp range. And if it isn't, it's going to take the device offline. According to UL 943, this happens at 6 milliamps or higher and will not trip at 4 milliamps or lower. The safe trip point is above 4 milliamps. So you're looking at 4 to 6 milliamps. So look at the picture we've got here, which is looking at your typical GFCI installation. 
Okay, so if you look at the uh, the power going out and the power coming back, not all of the power is in that circuit. Some of the power is leaving out through that hand that mysteriously is coming through the, the back of the slide there. So not all of it's actually making it back uh, to the origination in the circuit. So because some of the power is lost, we're creating an imbalance on that circuit and that imbalance will create a magnetic field and help trip that GFCI. More on the GFCI. GFCI protection does not protect against line to neutral shocks. So if you became part of that circuit by holding on to the hot and the neutral, and the current went straight through you, you could effectively become a low impedance path to go straight through with minimal work being done so there may not be enough power loss through you to actually trip that GFCI. The failure rate of a GFCI averages around 12 percent. The outdoor locations of course are going to be higher. You've got more extreme conditions. Those are be, going to be at a failure rate around 20 percent. In some high lightning areas you could be upwards around 50 percent. So keep in mind while they're not foolproof they're constantly getting better in the industry with these. Okay, here are some examples of GFCIs. Some of the things to remember, the failure rate is still close to 12%, even under the best conditions. If a lightning strike occurs, the GFCI most likely will fail while still allowing power into it. So it'll fail in the closed position. A ground wire isn't necessary for the function. So when people uh, correlate ground a ground and the GFCI, those are two separate par uh, portions of the code and two different requirements. A ground is not necessarily required for a, a regular run-of-the-mill GFCI to work properly. It's looking at the difference between the exiting and returning current. And it won't protect against line to neutral shocks and it's not meant to. Grounding electrode A conducting object that's used to make a direct connection and a, a direct electrical connection to the earth. Some of the examples have been around for a long period of time. Nothing really new here. Metal frame of the building. Metal underground water pipe. Concrete encased electrode. Ground ring. Grounding rod. And any other electrodes listed for this use. Grounding electrode conductor. A conductor used to connect the system grounded conductor or neutral or the equipment to the grounding electrode or the grounding electrode system. Okay, so your grounding electrode is say your ground rod. Your grounding electrode conductor is the wire that connects your ground rod to your box or the rest of your grounding system. Equipment grounding conductor. An intentional path that connects metal parts of the equipment which normally are not carrying current together and the grounded conductor or the grounding electrode conductor. Okay, here's an example. Notice we're in a solar setting here. Another example. 
The equipment grounding conductor can be any one or a combination of the types listed in 250.118. It must provide an effective ground fault path. This bar's new. 250.118 says the equipment grounding conductor run with or enclosing the circuit conductors shall be one or more or a combination of the following. Let's look at these five examples. Copper clad, copper or aluminum clad conductors could be solid or stranded, insulated, covered or bare, wire or bus bars of any shape. Two could be rigid metal conduit. Three could be intermediate metal conduit. Four could be electrical metallic tubing. And five could be flexible metal conduit as long as it terminates in the listed fittings has a 20 amp or less overcurrent, its length plus the liquid tight plus the flexible metallic tubing length combined is less than six feet so we don't have much to work with there and it's used where necessary to stop vibration or provide flexibility but an equipment grounding conductor shall be necessary. guest room. An accommodation that combines living, sleeping, sanitary, and storage within a quote-unquote compartment. Guest suite. Very similar to a guest room, but has two or more rooms in one compartment with or without doors between them. Hermetic refrigerant motor compressor. Combination of a compressor and a motor that are enclosed in the same housing. Has no external shaft or seals and the motors operating in the refrigerant. Okay, here's an example. Insight from also applies to within sight and within sight from. This is mentioned and no specific distance is given. The one piece of equipment has to be 50 feet or less invisible from the other piece of equipment. So notice our example here. And it's got to be in sight from. Doesn't say that it has to be on the same wall. inner system bonding termination. A device designed to connect inner system bonding conductors for communications systems to the grounding electrode system. Kitchen. An area, again with the area, similar to bathroom, with a sink and permanent provisions for cooking means that your countertop microwave will not be included as a permanent provision for cooking unless you mount it. Labeled. Materials or equipment that have a label similar marked by an organization acceptable to the local AHJ. Okay, notice the UL listing here. Damp location. Locations that are protected from weather and not likely to be saturated with water, but obviously could. This includes areas that are only partially protected, like open but covered porches, canopies, or even soffits. Wet location. Locations that are likely to be saturated with water or unprotected from the weather. 
This also includes locations that are in direct contact with the earth, are in concrete slabs or masonry, or of course are underground. <laughs> uh, boy, that would have to uh, that would have to be probably one of the more dangerous pictures I, I think I've ever seen, where people are still living. Nonlinear load. A load in which the wave shape of the current doesn't follow the wave shape of the voltage. Nonlinear loads occur when the resistance is not a constant and changes during each sine wave of the applied voltage waveform, resulting in a series of positive and negative pulses. Traditional load. For reference as to what we should see, we've got a picture here. Examples of nonlinear loads. Fluorescent lights, electronic ballasts, dimmers, motors with adjustable speed drives, computers, uh, data rooms. Overcurrent. Current that's in excess of the equipment rating caused from a ground fault, a short circuit, or an overload. Surge protective device. Three different types, type 1, permanently connected and listed for the installation between the utility, transformer, and the service equipment. And notice on the lower left here, we've got that, uh, it almost looks like a ring or a collar before that meter. That's your whole home sur uh, surge protection device. <coughs> type 2 permanently connected surge protected device listed for the installation on the load side of the service disconnecting means. So just a different point of of installation. Type 3 surge protective device listed for the installation on branch circuits. Uh, one final note on this you want to make sure that you actually have a ground in the receptacle that uh, these strips are plugged into because their safety relies on that ground. In the event of a short circuit, it basically shunts to ground to trip that device. Article 200. Now we're getting out of the definitions and into Article 200, which deals with identifying the ground and conductors of terminals. 200.2 B continuity of the neutral conductor neutral conductor shall not depend on a connection to a metallic enclosure raceway or cable armor for its continuity here you've got the metal being used to connect the neutral to the neutral terminal through the metal box okay, that's not acceptable Two fifty dot one one nine identifying an equipment grounding conductor. If the wire is six gauge or smaller, the equipment grounding conductor can be bare, green, or green with a yellow stripe. Article two ten Branch circuits. 210.3 branch circuit rating. The overcurrent device rating determines the branch circuit rating. 210.4D grouping of multiwire circuits. All conductors of a multiwire branch circuit have to be grouped together in at least one location. This will be done using cable ties or something similar usually at the point of origin. Here's your before and after. 
you'll notice on the left that we've got kind of a cluster however it's really it's not labeled uh, at all but if you look on the right uh, somebody has gone back through cleaned it up nicely and labeled it this should be done while marking the branch circuits in the box it'll not be necessary if all the wires for the circuit are in a single raceway or if the circuits are tagged. The National Electric Code wants to have number tags. Now remember we're talking about multi-wire circuits. We're not talking about just a normal circuit. 210.5 identify, uh, Identifying Branch Circuits 210.5C1B talks about how to identify them with your identifying means. If you have more than one voltage used on the system, the circuits have to be labeled at the panel or the board, and of course they've got to be labeled legibly. If you can't read it, then what good is it? 210.8 GFCI protection 210.8 GFCI protection GFCI devices required by 210.8A through D must be installed in readily accessible locations. You could venture back to the beginning of the program or break out your NEC to Article 100 and see what readily accessible locations are labeled as. Residentially speaking, this is designed to cover all 15 and 20 amp 125 volt receptacles in the following areas. Bathrooms, dwelling unit garages and accessory buildings. Now remember there's nothing that says that you have to put power out to an accessory building like a shed in the backyard. But if you do, it's got to be GFCI protected. Receptacles installed outside, there are requirements for that crawl spaces, unfinished areas of a basement, kitchen countertops, within six feet of the outer edge of a sink. Okay, some of that is diminished as well once you get into bathrooms and things like that. A boathouse is another one. Within six feet of the outer edge of a bathtub or shower and laundry areas. Continuing on with 210.8, B deals with other than dwelling units. Got to be in other than dwelling unit bathrooms, kitchens, rooftops, obviously for serviceable means, outdoor areas within six feet of a sink, indoor wet locations, locker rooms with shower facilities, and garages, service bays, or any other similar area. 210.11 Branch Circuit Requirements 210.11a talks about the number of general light and general use receptacle circuits in a dwelling unit. Annex D gives the best examples that we've got. Looking at those examples, measuring the floor area of the structure along the outside wall, find the square footage. Here we've got 75 feet in one direction, 20 feet in the other direction. So we take 75 by 20 and we get 1,500 square feet. You take that number times 3 VA. So we've got 1,500 square feet times 3 VA equals what? 4,500. And there are other optional calculation methods uh, for figuring out the general lighting and use outlets. Those are in 220.82B1. 
and 220.83A1 for dwelling units. Um, and more specifically, those optional methods deal with existing dwelling units. 220.12, general lighting loads by occupancy. Okay, notice where it says here for dwelling units, for our square feet uh, for volt amps, that's where we're getting this, uh, table 220.12, it tells you 3VA per square foot. So just in case you were wondering where in the world we come up with the 3VA per square foot. Annex D, again, going into D1A, figure the voltage that your circuits will have, normally 120 volts, and figure that in to find out how many circuits you can get out of it. So we figured 4500 VA divided by 120 volts equals 38 amps. So your options here are to have two 20 amp circuits or three 15 amp circuits. There are quite a few other factors that go into this calculation. Um, there's a derating factor over 3000 VA, like you'll see in table 220.42. And the derat, uh, here's an example of some of the derating factors uh, that you that we're talking about here. Derating factor for dwelling units calculated by multiplying the following percentages for the corresponding amounts of VA that has been calculated. Okay, for the first 3000 VA we take it 100 at 100%, so it'll be 3000 VA. You will then, at 3001, up to 120,000 VA, multiply by 35%. So it'll be the first 3000 plus whatever your second calculation here comes out to be. There are standard amounts of VA that are add this calculation based on the circuit as well. They are the small appliance circuits, which are 1500 VA each, the laundry circuit, which is 1500 VA, the electric dryer, which is 5000 VA, or the nameplate rating. You take the largest one for that calculation. If you've got four or more fastened in place appliances, excluding dryers, ranges, space heating, and AC equipment, derated to 75% of the load. Here's your example of your calculation in example D1A for family dwelling units. And there are multiple examples that deal with different scenarios in your Annex D uh, location. Two ten dot eleven B. Make sure you space things out evenly, as it deals with evenly proportioned loads. You must make sure after your loads are calculated that they're evenly balanced from one branch circuit to another, and the wiring is calculated properly for the expected load. 210.11 talks about branch circuits that are going to be required. 210.11c deals specifically with dwelling units. C1, two or more 20 amp, 120 volt small appliance circuits to cover the outlets in the kitchen, the dining room, the breakfast room, the pantry, and small dining areas. Now just on a side note, when we did our D1 calculation just a second ago, and we were trying to decide whether we're gonna, we were going to use two 20 amp circuits or three 15 amp circuits, most commonly you're going to go with the 20 amp circuits because that's what most of the requirements revolve around. 
20 amp 120 volt circuits required for the laundry outlets. Those are required by 210.52F as well. You aren't allowed to add a receptacle or an outlet that's not in the laundry area to the laundry area. Just remember. So if you've got uh, an adjoining wall with a bedroom, you're not allowed to sneak off the re receptacles that are in the laundry room to bring it through the wall to the other side to that bedroom. Two ten point eleven brand circuits required continued on with C and again we're talking with C uh, dealing with the uh, laundry outlets in C2 and 210.52F this receptacle is still going to be required you know you got to remember your your requirement specifically says in C2 that 120 amp 120 volt circuit is required for the laundry outlets required by 210.52 so the receptacle is still required even if, if the appliance being used will use another receptacle due to different power requirements and the example would be a stackable washer dryer combo could use a 30 amp 240 volt receptacle and not use that receptacle at all 210.11 still in the brand circuits required we're moving on to C3 uh, which deals with bathrooms and one 20 amp 120 volt receptacle required for the bathroom receptacles the outlets that aren't in the bathroom aren't allowed on the bathroom circuit plain as day you, you can supply all the outlets in a single uh, bathroom if you'd like okay on a single 120 volt 20 amp bathroom circuit and okay? these can include the lights uh, as well as long as no single load more than 10 amps and you can reference 210.23a1 and 2 for that um, particular uh, requirement and what you'll find there 210.23A1 says cord and plug equipment not fastened in place is allowed to draw 80% of the load. And 210.23A2 says cord and plug equipment fastened in place is allowed to draw 50% of the load. Here's your arc fault breaker. 210.12 is going to get into uh, AFCI protection. And when it comes to AFCI protection, uh, we're, we're in an area where not everything's going to be on the receptacle end of things. This is, you know, your new wave arc fault breaker where both the line and neutral go into the breaker and the neutral connects back to the box uh, on the neutral side and primarily what you're looking for here is a characteristic of an arc fault. All 15 and 20 amp 120 volt branch circuits that supply outlets or devices in these locations require arc fault protection. What locations? Bedrooms, closets, dens, dining rooms, family rooms, hallways, kitchens, laundry areas, libraries, living rooms, parlors, rec rooms, sunrooms, and any other similar area. So notice we got arc fault protection requirements actually in the kitchens and dining rooms in a lot of the same places that we have GFCI protection there is a potential in which you'll have arc fault and GFCI protection required in overlapping scenarios. 210.12a does have some exceptions. Okay, one of the exceptions deals with fire alarms. Okay, and the short and sweet of it is if 
the smoke alarm or the fire alarm is not controlled by the panel, then it doesn't qualify as a fire alarm circuit. So arc vault uh, will be required. If they go to a panel, it will most likely not be required. And again, uh, that's all subject to the authority having jurisdiction and any amendments that may be in your area. But listen to one of the exceptions. One of the exceptions references you over to 760.121, which is power surf, uh, sources for PLFA circuits. And it says in B, uh, dealing with branch circuits, the branch circuit supplying the fire alarm circuit shall supply no other loads. The location of the branch circuit over current protective device shall be permanently identified at the fire alarm control unit. The circuit disconnecting means shall have red identification, shall be accessible only to qualified personnel, and shall be identified as fire alarm circuit. The red identification shall not damage the overcurrent protective devices or obscure the manufacturer's markings. This branch circuit shall not be supplied through ground fault circuit interrupters or arc fault circuit interrupters. And another exception, uh, another area that this exception actually references you to is 760.41B. Uh, which deals with um, non-power limited fire alarm circuits as well and it says the same almost identical thing and that's 760.41b is your other reference point uh, for this exception to the rule so like I said short and sweet it goes to a panel doesn't qualify or if it goes to a panel, it won't uh, it won't require arc fault or GFCI. But if it doesn't go to a panel, it's probably not going to qualify as a fire alarm circuit either, and it's going to be required to have arc fault protection. 210.12b talks about branch circuit extensions or modifications, more particularly with dwelling units. In areas where branch circuits uh, are modified or replaced or extended the circuit must be protected by an AFCI circuit breaker or an AFCI receptacle at the first outlet now remember there will be a requirement also in the branch circuit area that says that this circuits gonna have to be grounded uh, at least to that first receptacle doesn't have anything to do with the way that the arc fault circuit interrupter works it has to do with creating an effective ground fault path that goes all the way back to the panel the exception if the extension is less than six feet when no devices or outlets are added 210.17 electric vehicles an outlet that has been installed for the purpose of charging uh, electric vehicles shall be on a dedicated branch circuit with no other outlets. 210.18 Guest Rooms or Suites Guest Rooms or Suites have to be wired according to the branch circuit requirements for dwelling units. Okay, so as you might guess staying in hotels uh, when you look around there would be a distinct difference uh, between whether or not um, you're considered a suite or a dwelling unit or a guest room as far as how the wiring is done uh, for the most part obviously you're going to have circuit protection and all that kind of stuff be fairly close in all those applications where habitation habitation is going to take place however there are some fairly um, small nuances between those uh, that would definitely make a big difference in a multi-story hotel. 210.23 Permissible Loads 210.23 uh, says in no case shall the load exceed the branch circuit amp rating. <clears throat> 210.23 um, 
goes on in section A that says 15 and 20 amp circuits can supply lights and utilization uh, equipment. A1 says it can go on and uh, include cord and plug as long as they're not fastened in place. Uh, it can only pull up to 80% of the circuit amp rating if it's cord and plug not fastened in place. A2 talks about utilization in, uh, equipment that is fastened in place and it can only pull up to 50% of the circuit amp rating. Remember, both of these are indicating that there's something else on that circuit as well. So uh, the 50% and 80% is, you know, if in addition to whatever's pulling that, uh, that amp draw on the system, you also have uh, potentially a light or something else plugged into that circuit as well. Uh, A2C says that 40 and 50 amp circuits can contain cooking appliances that are fastened in place. Okay, so that's uh, a bit of an anomaly. And A2C also says uh, that you can have 50 amp circuits uh, that can supply non-lighting load outlets only as well. So it just breaks the mold of the 15 and 20 amp circuit uh, requirements that we've got here. goes into a few nuances. So as we head into part three that deals with required outlets, uh, just to give you folks that are keeping track uh, a little update where if you're following along the code book you should be in a normal uh, traditional National Electric code book you should be on page 60. Uh, it's not the same in the handbook, but if you're following along in a traditional, it'll be the same. We're going into part three, dealing with required outlets. 210.50 uh, deals with your general requirements. Requirements for installing outlets shall be done in accordance with 210.52 through 210.64. Small section, Lots of stuff in it. 210.50A deals with cord and pendants. Don't overlook the fact that flexible cord and pendant receptacles are still receptacles. They are still uh, allowed to achieve the requirements that may be required, whether residential uh, or commercial, in areas uh, that do require the receptacles. 250.C appliance receptacles. The concept here is very simple. If the receptacle is intended for a specific appliance, like laundry equipment, the example given here, then that receptacle's got to be within six feet of the intended appliance. And it seems like that's an awful long ways away because most of the cords, uh, unless you're going to change out the cords or buy a longer whip or something, are not going to extend six feet. Uh, but nonetheless, that is the rule. 21052 dwelling unit receptacle outlets. 21052 covers 125 volt 15 and 20 amp receptacle outlets. The outlets are in addition to those that are part of the luminaire appliance, controlled by a wall switch, like you see in 21070A1 exception ones, switched receptacles, or those in cabinets or cupboards, so potentially one that would be covered up, uh, such as one that you would plug a hanging microwave into, are those located five and a half feet off the floor. Remember, it's in addition to those receptacles. 21052 uh, deals with the switching of receptacles and I wanted to take just a second and just point out the fact your wall placing on your receptacle requirements uh, requires your basic you know in a dwelling unit 6 foot 12 foot rule so you should be able to go to any point along the wall and within 6 feet of that point one direction or the other you can reach a receptacle 
That requirement does not say that you have to use a duplex receptacle like the one pictured here. What the requirement says is you have to have a receptacle. The advantage that you get with a duplex receptacle is in the event that you need to achieve a lighting requirement as well as a wall spacing receptacle requirement, you could meet both with one du duplex receptacle by uh, separating the top and, and bottom receptacle. And then you could achieve your lighting requirements at 21070A1 uh, and then the receptacle requirements at 21052A1. Two ten fifty two. Getting into the heart of it, a general requirements for a dwelling unit. A one deals with spacing. The requirement for a receptacle to be installed in every kitchen, family room, dining room, living room, bedroom, etc., says that no point along the floor line of any wall space should be farther than six feet from a receptacle. That's why we slang term call it the six foot, 12 foot rule. Uh, the rule says no further than six feet in one direction or the other from a receptacle or to get to a receptacle. When in reality, if you went dead smack in the middle of two receptacles that were right on the money, six feet, both directions, it would be 12 feet between the two. 21052A2 deals with wall space. Wall space in the dwelling units shall include one, any space that's two feet or more and unbroken along the floor line by doors or similar openings, fireplaces and fixed cabinets. This includes spaces around corners. You can't go caddy corner for your spacing requirement. Two, fixed panels on interior walls. Large glass panels like those found in the sliding doors uh, that don't actually slide. Now, when you've got sliding doors, generally you've got one panel that slides and one panel that doesn't. Three, fixed room dividers such as railings. Now, one thing that throws a wrench and oftentimes a homeowner into a tailspin is the requirement at 21052A23 fixed room dividers such as railings because this also can refer to banisters at the top of a long stairway uh, or along a lofted walkway in a vaulted room. Uh, you've got banisters along those edges so that somebody can overlook uh, say the the living room from a vaulted area. That could be considered wall space and you would have to have a receptacle in that area. Now, obviously, if you've got the nice spindled um, banister along that walkway, you're not going to put the receptacle in that banister. What you're going to do is you're going to probably put it in the floor. And they do make nice alternatives for the floor-mounted uh, receptacles. So here is an example of your requirement. This is the 6 foot, 12 foot rule. Any point on the wall should be no further than six feet from the nearest receptacle. So if you're in the middle, dead smack in the middle between two receptacles, it could be 12 feet total. So notice even the small little two foot space in the middle center requires its own receptacle because of the requirement. Two ten fifty two a three uh, is a part I wanted to point out. I just talked about that. If you've got a vaulted area or a walkway that has a banister and no no wall on the other side, say you've got a banister on both sides, your receptacle is still that uh, is still something that you're going to have to have in those areas. So you have to keep that in mind, um, and you may have to put a floor receptacle in there in order to comply. Four receptacles may be counted as your required receptacles, but only if they're installed within 18 inches of the wall. Hey, here's another example. Imagine having this beautiful hardwood and still um, having to put a four receptacle in there. 
Again, they make good alternatives for it, uh, so you'll have to plan ahead and make sure that the homeowner is aware of this requirement. Two ten fifty two A four countertop receptacles. Dwelling unit receptacles versus countertop receptacles is a little bit different. Countertop receptacles are installed according to two fifty uh, two ten fifty two C and countertop requirements cannot be used to achieve the requirements of the general dwelling units in 21052A. Now, what does that mean? In looking at this picture, what this means is you're not allowed to use your receptacle on that countertop to achieve your receptacle requirements along the wall spacing there on the floor. So you may end up with a couple receptacles that are extremely close to each other. 21052 dealing with dwelling unit receptacle outlet requirements. This is section B, small appliance circuits. 21052B1 dealing with small appliance circuits says the 20 amp 120 volt small appliance circuits covered in 21011C1 and the requirements found in 21052A and C are meant to extend to kitchens, breakfast rooms, pantries, and dining rooms. Okay, now remember we had the option clear back when we were talking about the annex and the calculations uh, for a dwelling unit to split after we calculated the VA that we needed and divide it by 120, uh, 120 volts. We were allowed to do two 20 amp receptacles or three 15 amp receptacle circuits um, in those areas. And although three circuits sounded better, um, most of these requirements are all 20 amp circuit requirements like the small appliance circuit requirement. 21052B1, exception number two. Refrigerators are allowed to be on a dedicated branch circuit as long as it's rated 15 amps or more. So you can have it on its own circuit. It doesn't have to be on the small appliance circuit. The one anomaly is you're not allowed to extend that refrigerator plug uh, or I'm sorry, um, that res uh, refrigerator's flexible cord up over the top of the countertop to a plug-in that's up there. It ha would have to be something that's not uh, in a fixed position like that uh, above the countertop. 21052B3, kitchen receptacle requirements. Here we have a nice wide open kitchen. You have to have at least two small appliance circuits in the kitchen. They can also supply the pantry, breakfast room, dining room, uh, all of the other requirements uh, in 21052B1, but it cannot supply another kitchen. Two ten fifty two c one talking about wall countertop spacing. Each countertop space shall have a receptacle. At no point on the wall space should the receptacle be more than 24 inches away in one direction or the other horizontally from that area. So what are we talking about there? Well, in a dwelling unit living room, it was a 6 foot, 12 foot rule. Here we're talking a 2 foot, 4 foot rule. So at no point should you be able to touch a countertop space and be more than two feet in one direction or another from a receptacle. Okay, so if you were smack dab in the middle, you effectively could be four feet between the receptacles itself. Okay, there are exceptions. Normally, they're not going to be required behind a sink or a range. In addition, they're not supposed to be more than 20 inches off the top of the countertop, and you'll find this at 21052 C5. Exemptions. We talked about this just a second ago. 
Normally not, you're not going to find it's required around uh, the back of a sink. Okay? However, if there's more than 18 inches behind that sink, that requirement will be there. The illustration in the NEC clearly shows if you've got less than 12 inches behind the sink or the range, less than 18 inches if it's a corner, then no receptacle is required. If you've got more than 18 inches, you're certainly going to have that requirement extend behind that, uh, that corner there on the picture on the right. This is the actual picture out of the NEC that, the, that is given for your example. The illustration fairly clearly shows that if you've got less than 12 inches behind a sink or range, 18 if it's in a corner, then you don't have to have a receptacle. 21052C2, Island Countertop Spaces. Each island space has to have at least one receptacle. The requirement is one receptacle. Island dimensions necessary to meet this requirement are a minimum 24 inches long and 24 inches wide. That's your minimum requirement. If that was all one island countertop, nothing on there, the requirement's one receptacle. Now, some municipalities have that extended out to mean uh, that you have to have two receptacles, but the requirement in the NEC is one. 21052C3 Peninsular countertop spaces are very similar. Each peninsular space has to have at least one receptacle, same as the island. The dimensions are exactly the same, but you have to remember that the peninsular starts at the connecting edge of the counter, not at the wall. So your minimum diameter or your minimum length from the countertop to the end of the peninsular is 24 inches long and a minimum width 24 inches wide to that connecting edge. Now it is possible that in that area you may not have any place to put a receptacle. Maybe not on the end, maybe not in the countertop. Uh, you know there are scenarios where that comes up. You will notice almost dead center here that you've got a flip down door with a receptacle inside of that space and that believe it or not is not just something that somebody came up with on a whim that's a designed product for that purpose it's for your upper end uh, custom style kitchens that don't want the visibility of that additional receptacle because they don't use it all the time so uh, they only have it exposed while it's being used some municipalities will have some different requirements there so for instance uh, one municipality will not allow you to have that kind of installation unless there's a way to only activate that plug when the lid is slid back into a position that the lid cannot be closed on the plug that goes into it. We have all kinds of new devices that are allowing us to be a little bit more upscale make things look a little bit nicer and still comply with code. These are some in countertop uh, style receptacles and these are UL listed and approved for the for the wet purpose. 21052C4 separate countertop spaces. Traditional kitchens oftentimes are going to have appliances that are spaced out uh, so that they make sense to actually use. They're not going to be all grouped together. <clears throat> They're not going to be installed to make it so it's easier to comply with code. They're going to be spaced so that they make sense. Usually, this will create uh, little separations in the countertop, oftentimes, say, between the range and the stove, maybe a little, uh, like almost a, a little part of countertop that just kind of stands out by itself. These are going to have to have receptacles. 21052C4 deals with these separate countertop spaces. If you have countertops that have areas separated by a sink, range, refrigerator, or another similar appliance, the space has to comply with 21052C1. Okay, so you'll notice here if you've got a space that's 12 inches or wider, like the far right there between that range, and maybe there's a, a refrigerator 
on the right hand side of that arrow. Well, it's broken up the countertop into a 12 inch space. That 12 inch space will now have to have its own countertop receptacle and then the receptacle requirements on the left hand side of that range uh, is going to start from there and you'll be, have to have another receptacle within 12 or 2 feet from that range. And again, here's another great example. If you have countertops that have areas separated by a sink, range, refrigerator, or other similar appliance, it has to comply with 21052C1. Again, if there's less than 12 inches behind the sink, you don't have to have a receptacle. The requirement says if there's more than 12 inches behind that sink, you will have to have a receptacle behind there. More with this 21052C4. Peninsulas and islands are no different. If you have a peninsular space or an island space and you've got more than 12 inches separating the closest edge of that sink to the other edge of the uh, or the larger edge of the countertop of the peninsular or island like you see in the left hand example here with a sink more than 12 inches it's not considered a broken space so the requirement is only one receptacle in that entire space it doesn't matter if that island is 20 feet long it's still going to be considered one space if you have the space separated by a range or some other appliance that creates a space that is less than 12 inches from the back of it to the edge of the countertop such as the example in uh, the right hand side here then that will be considered two separate spaces and will require one receptacle in each of those spaces. We're still referring to countertops here, but we're talking about 21052C5 with outlet locations. Receptacles shall be located on, above, but no more than 20 inches above, in as long as listed for it or below but not more than 12 inches and only if the counter overhangs less than 6 inches for the countertop. Those are your requirements. There are exceptions. Okay? You've got an exception here. Exception 2 if the island or peninsula is completely flat with no backsplashes or dividers and no means to mount a receptacle 20 inches above the, above the countertop like cabinets, then there is no receptacle requirement. That is a valuable place uh, to start when you're looking for uh, ways to comply with the code in the peninsula or the island uh, compliance area. Because there are absolutely some areas where you're not going to be able to install that. Now, if you're thinking about it, some guys are really wrapping their heads around that thinking, now, how would there ever be a scenario where I absolutely could not put a receptacle in there? Well, what if you didn't have any overhang at all on that peninsula or island and there was drawers out both sides that slid right up to the edge of the, uh, the wood so that you could not mount a receptacle in there uh, because it would slide into, it, it would be slid into by the doors and such. There are some scenarios that this will really help you out. It's not there as a get out of jail free card, but it's there to aid you in compliance in areas that you absolutely cannot follow the traditional rules. 21052C5 deals with receptacle outlet locations and appliance garages. If you have an appliance garage, it can't be used to meet your spacing requirements for the countertop receptacles. However, your receptacle, uh, your receptacles for the countertop uh, small appliance circuit can extend right on inside of the appliance uh, garage. So you can have it in there, but it can't be used to meet your receptacle requirements. So your, your two foot rule would start on either side of that uh, appliance garage and, and head out along the wall space and you'd have to have a receptacle within two feet there. 21052D, bathroom requirements. 
Okay, we've talked about earlier that there are receptacle requirements and GFCI requirements and such around sinks. Um, and we talked about sinks just in general having a six foot rule. Uh, if, you're, if you're around a, a sink, you're gonna have to have GFCI protection uh, within six feet around that in a radial um, spherical style around. But in a bathroom, your receptacle requirements, <clears throat> say you must have a receptacle 1520 amp, of course, is a requirement here, as most of them are, within three feet of the outside edge of each basin or sink. So we're talking a three foot radius, okay, and that's a parameter, all directions, any of these areas, could be on the outer side of the cabinet, could be in front of the cabinet, but new requirements allow no further than 12 inch bo inches below the front edge of the sink and it can be in the sink or in between the sinks on the countertop area. Two ten fifty two E deals with outdoor requirements. Receptacles need to be in these areas outdoors in these locations in a one and two family dwelling one receptacle in the front and back of the dwelling at grade level. It shall be readily accessible and no more than six and a half feet above grade. Two, multifamily dwellings. You only have to have your receptacle outside in the front and back at a uh, multifamily dwelling on the dwelling units that are at grade level and that's it. Three, on balconies, decks and porches. Only required when attached to the dwelling and accessible from inside. So right outside your back sliding door for instance. You shall have a receptacle that's no more than six and a half feet above and accessible from the balcony, deck, or porch walking surface. 21052F gets into laundry areas. In dwelling units, you have to have at least one receptacle, 15 amp or 20 amp, 120 volt, in the designated area where the laundry equi equipment is intended to be installed, even if it's not being used. And one example that was given uh, recently is what if I've got a, a new construction home and the person that's paid for the home, that's buying the home, going to move into the home, has a stackable washer and dryer. So they would never use a 120 volt, uh, 15, 20 amp circuit. Uh, they would only use the elevated probably 30 amp 230 volt circuit. So what what would you do then? The requirements there even if it's not being used. And notice it talks about laundry area not laundry room. Exception one it shall not be required in a single dwelling of a multifamily dwelling unit that has laundry facilities provided for use by all building occupants. Okay, so if you've got one dwelling of a multifamily dwelling unit that has laundry facilities already for everybody, you don't have to uh, abide by this rule. You don't have to have the laundry circuit um, inside of the single dwelling in this instance. 21052G, Basements, garages, and accessory buildings. In a single family dwelling, at least one receptacle outlet shall be in these areas required by 21052G1 through 3. These, of course, are in addition to any that might be required for specific reasons uh, dealing with potentially specific equipment. Garages. If a detached or attached garage, notice the key word there, if, has electrical power supplied, you have to have one receptacle in each car space, minimally. So 
So as you can see here in this garage, we don't have a requirement. We've got one receptacle dead center in the middle and no receptacle in each space. Accessory buildings, which is 21052G2. Accessory buildings uh, have to have at least one outlet receptacle in each accessory building that has electrical power supplied. Nothing says you have to supply power to this fancy little shed with an open and, uh, you know, with, a, with an inward door and an outward door on the other side. Uh, a little bit more fancy than what I've got, but nothing says you have to supply power to this. But if you do, uh, one, it's going to have to be GFCI protected, and two, uh, it's going to have to have at least one outlet receptacle. Basements. You have to have a receptacle outlet in each unfinished area of the basement. In speaking with several code officials and looking at this picture, uh, this is all con considered one unfinished area until they start extending the wall out and separating the space a little bit more. So in this area, your requirement is one. Remember, if you have a finished basement, the outlet requirements of 21052 are enforceable depending on how the basement's finished. If you've got a secondary living space or kitchen or bathroom, uh, those requirements may all revert back to 21052A um, through C, which deal with your countertop space and your wall spacing requirements and all of that. Two ten fifty two H hallways. If a hallway is at least ten feet long, the requirement says you have to have one receptacle, at least one receptacle. If the measurement is made along the center line without passing through the doorway, that is. Okay, so your measurement in the hallway is ten feet as long as you're not passing through the doorway. So if you have a forty foot bath or a forty foot hallway, the requirement doesn't say you have to have at least four receptacles, one every 10 feet. The requirement says if it's at least 10 feet, you have to have at least one receptacle. 21060, guest rooms, suites, and dorms. 21060A, general requirements. In these areas usually found in hotels and sleeping rooms and dorms, the minimal requirements are those of 21052A and D. Okay, so your 21052A and D are still at play here. If there are also permanent provisions for cooking, they'll have to comply with all of 210.52. So the difference is whether or not we're talking permanent provisions for cooking. Oftentimes you're going to see a, a countertop microwave be all that you have. Uh, but if that microwave leaves the countertop and is now mounted uh, up above the, the counter or you have a cooktop or something like that, we could have a permanent provision for cooking and become the same as a dwelling unit as far as requirements go. 21060B, receptacle placement. Hey, this is kind of interesting. The quantity of receptacles must be the same as the requirements in a normal dwelling unit, but... The spacing requirements may be altered to fit the placement of the furniture. So that is different. And now we go back to the old mentality of usable wall space, which hasn't really been in the code book since the 50s. Uh, if you have a couch there, by nowadays standards, I, I wouldn't consider that usable wall space, but it doesn't exempt you in a normal house from using um, that space for a receptacle because you still have to meet your receptacle requirements. Here we're saying when we get into guest rooms and suites and, and dorms that um, the requirements can be altered to fit the placement of the furniture and usually that's going to be because you have such a small living area. If the receptacle is behind the bed, this is another example given in the code book. It has to be in a way that prevents the attachment plug from touching the bed or it must be guarded. 
at least two receptacles shall be readily accessible. And you also have all the same requirements for GFCI that you'll find in later chapters. Article 300, General Requirements for Wiring Methods. 300.1 uh, deals with wiring installations in Part A and integral parts of the equipment in Part B. Okay, 300.1a, this article covers all general wiring methods for all installations unless, unless modified in other chapters, could be modified in chapters 5, 6, and 7, or even in 8, and B, integral parts of the equipment, this article does not apply to conductors that are integral parts of accepted or listed equipment. These are conductors that are replaced there by the manufacturer during the manufacturing process of the equipment. 300.2 limitations. 300.2a voltages. Wiring methods in Chapter 3 are designed for voltages that are up to but not higher than 1000 volts unless specifically permitted or allowed elsewhere in the code. 300.2b temperatures. Temperature limitations of the conductors are in accordance with 31015A3. Now 31015A3 is called temperature limitations of conductors. It references tables that you look up with the allowable ampacities and temp limitations and their derating tables for elevated temperatures similar to uh, what you would you would use for 310, 15, B2, A, and B. 300.3 conductors. 300.3a single conductors. Single conductors as specified in 310.104a have to be installed within a recognized wiring method. So in looking at what we've got here, we got some knob and tube. And while this may be an existing building, now look at the size of the wood, true sizes of wood, you don't see that anymore. Um, and it may actually still be used. It's there under the existing building exemption. It's not posing a, a danger or a threat and it hasn't been upgraded because the building probably hasn't been modified to make it be upgraded. However, you wouldn't see this put back in in a new building because it's no longer a recognized wiring method. They want all of the conductors for a, um, a circuit to be run together within the same wiring method. 300.3 conductors. In 300.3b, same circuit conductors. There are some exemptions to this rule, but generally all conductors of the same circuit, including grounding and bonding conductors, shall be grouped in the same wiring method. Some of the exceptions are found in 300.3b1 through 4. 300.4 protection against physical damage. If the wires are going to be subject to damage, obviously you should be protecting them. Okay, some of the ways that you would protect them. A strike plate. Strike plates are neat, they're handy, uh, and if you try to screw into them or nail into them, they're going to definitely let you know it ain't going to go in there. Okay, on wood, if it's been notched or bored and the hole leaves less than a quarter inch in front of the stud, you have to use a strike plate. It also applies if it's likely that a nail or a screw can penetrate it. Okay, that's 300.4b2. You could use a bushing. If you've got non-metallic cable going through steel framing, now we use all kinds of steel studs now, it's got to be protected with a bushing. Support. If cables or raceways are supported to framing or furring strips, it has to be supported. Okay, there is really no specific method 
as to the intervals of the support. So that's going to be up to your AHJ, uh, possibly depending on the scenario, uh, could be up to more than one authority there. It can't be closer to the front edge of the wall than a quarter inch, or it has to be protected from nails and screws. Uh, if it's above a drop ceiling, the non-metallic cable still has to be supported. It's not allowed to be laid on those uh, ceiling tiles according to its applicable article in 300.4 C. 300.4 G insulated fittings. If the wire is larger than 4 gauge, the wiring method that goes into the box, cabinet or enclosure has to terminate with an insulated fitting. Okay, some of these are just little nuances uh, that are in the code that are there for specific purposes, usually uh, pertaining to heat buildup, fire, uh, or general contra contact uh, with the wire through the sheathing if it uh, gets rubbed or bare. 300.6 deals with corrosion and protection against it. 300.6A3, concrete or direct concrete burial with the earth. Ferrous, uh, ferrous metal raceways or boxes can be in contact with or even in concrete as long as it's either listed for the application, okay, that should go without saying, or if it's not listed, protected against corrosion. Some of the examples would be EMT, galvanized EMT. Uh, it requires corrosion protection. Rigid metal con conduit, though, if it's galvanized, does not normally require anything additional as far as protection goes. 300.7, raceways exposed to different temperatures. 300.7B, expansion fittings. Uh, raceways shall be permitted with expansion fittings if thermal expansion is a possibility. Hey, if you've got long runs, and high temperature swings. Usually we're talking a 100 degree temperature swing. Hey, for instance, in the Midwest, uh, it is completely likely that you could get down below zero in the wintertime, yet also above 100 degrees in the summertime. So you've got that 100 degree temperature swing there. Uh, metal, plastic, uh, and everything in between expands and contracts with that high amount of temperature change. So having expansion fittings is very valuable in this uh, scenario. 352.44 deals with PVC expansion uh, and of course it's given as the next example. Okay, right here. If you've got a temperature change of 100 degrees, we're talking bottom center of this chart, then the length of, cha uh, of change for this PVC conduit is how far? Four inches for every 100 feet. So if you've got a temperature swing of 100 degrees, like most places in the Midwest, then you very easily could have a four inch uh, gain or lag in that PVC conduit. 300.10 Electrical Continuity of Metal Raceways and Enclosures If you have to form an effective ground fault path between all raceways, cables, and enclosures to make sure the circuit's overcurrent device will work in the event of a fault, then of course you're going to have to consult the NEC to do so. An effective ground fault path is one that's installed on purpose, as we discussed earlier, to provide electrical continuity from the equipment or the appliance all the way back to the panel. Hey, this is different from a regular just run-of-the-mill ground fault path. A ground fault path is generally going to be any method uh, that can take a electrical current to earth, to the ground. Now here we're talking about an effective ground fault path, which is one that's put there by you on purpose to take that electrical continuity back to the panel so that we can aid in the tripping of the breaker, popping of the fuse, whatever the, the case may be. 300.12, 
mechanical continuity. Raceways shall be mechanically continuous between the fittings and the enclosure box or panel. Why is that? Well, if, if they're not electrically continuous uh, and you've got a little gap in there and you start to uh, run electrical current on the outside of that uh, fitting or the raceway, then, uh, you know, knuckle-headed me comes along and touches one side and then the other side or bumps into it, I could bridge the gap there and that current could run through me to the other side where there's also metal conduit. So I could become part of that circuit. 300.13 deals with conductors and a mechanical and electrical continuity. 300.13a, general. No splices or taps inside of the conduit should go without saying. You can't service them. You can't see when there's an issue either. 300.14, the length of free conductors at outlets, junctions, and switch points. Well, we're always asking, okay, how much conductors, uh, how much of the free conductor are, are we supposed to be pulling uh, when we're wiring up our switches or our receptacles or any of those things? It gives us the answer right here in 300.14. You have to have at least six inches from the point it leaves the conductor, or I'm sorry, from the point it leaves the conduit or the connector at the box. Uh, 300.20, induced current in ferrous metal enclosures or raceways. Alternate current circuits in order to minimize the possibility of induction. Remember, induction is the creation of current using the magnetic field of the wires. Okay, we want to minimize current on the actual uh, metal enclosures, of course, especially if they're ferrous, which is mag uh, magnetic. Minimizing the possibility of induction on box and metal uh, conduit, etc., you must group all the conductors together. Uh, gr uh, grouping them all together uh, makes them have opposing magnetic fields. It doesn't cancel each other out, like some people say in slang. What it does is it cancels the effects so that you don't have, or at least you minimize, the risk of those magnetic fields on that ferrous metal. 300.22b, wiring in duct work. Ducts that carry heating and cooling ventilation are only allowed to have wiring methods in or through them if it's necessary to make the equipment operate properly or accessory uh, or equipment. So sometimes there's accessories uh, that are mounted inside the duct work that could necessitate wiring, or if the product is listed for the installation and the AHJ allows the installation. 300.22C is an exception. It allows passing through joists or studs that are used for environmental air. Now, oftentimes we'll see thermal pan or some kind of uh, metal that's placed on the studs or the joists uh, that allows us to use return air for part of the duct work in the mechanical system. Uh, 300.22C allows you to have wires that will pass through those areas. Uh, one thing that's kind of an anomaly, maybe a little bit of a sidebar, if you're utilizing combustion air drawn through the attic from the soffits into the mechanical room, some inspectors will view that attic as now being part of the ducted system and will not be happy with you uh, in that instance in using the attic with open wiring, can lights, things like that, and will, uh, you know, possibly make you meet even stricter requirements than you normally would uh, for your wiring methods in that attic. So think twice about how you bring combustion air into a mechanical room. Uh, my suggestion would be to mechanically duct it. 310.15 Ampacities. Okay, here is wires up to 2,000 volts. Okay, your different amp ampacity ratings. Now notice this is table 310, 15, 
B16, probably one of the more common tables that you'll use for wire sizing in the, co in the code book. Obviously there's no D rating or anything like that on this uh, particular uh, chart, but you've got your opacities on both sides and that's to make it uh, convenient so that you can see copper on the one side easily without tracing it around and aluminum or copper clad on the other side. Three ten fifteen B sizing tables. You'll find sizing tables at three ten fifteen B sixteen through nineteen. And some of the factors that you'll be considering here are ambient temperature, overcurrent protection, compliance with product listings and any other safety related influences. Again, this is just an example of table 31015B16 that would be used uh, for sizing. But of course there's 31015B16, 17, 18, and 19 which fit uh, of course different applications. Chapter 4. Chapter 4 is titled equipment for general use. Article 400 flexible cords and flexible cables. 400.1 the scope the overview of this very chapter says that it covers general requirements for flexible cords and cables in construction and otherwise. Okay, that's a pretty broad statement for and otherwise. The suitability at 400.3 Cords have to be suitable for the environment they're in. This includes the fact that they may possibly have to be guarded, supported, watertight, or corrosion resistant. 400.5 Ampacity of flexible cords and flexible cables. Tables 400.5A1 and 400.5A2 have the conductor opacity in cords and cables with up to three current carrying conductors at ambient temperatures of up to 86 degrees Fahrenheit. If the temperatures are supposed to get above 86 degrees Fahrenheit, you're going to need to derate the acceptable opacities using table 400.5A3. Four hundred point six A markings. Remember, if a cord's listed for an unusual location, it'll say so in a factory-made marking on the cord. Some of the examples: corrosive, uh, corrosive locations, wet, sunlight or UV resistant, or high temperature, etc. Four hundred point seven gives us our permitted uses for these flexible cords and cables. 400.7a pendants wiring of luminaires or self-contained lighting apparatuses 3 portable lamps signs or appliances 4 connection of interchangeable equipment and 5 to simply prohibit noise transmission convenience okay here are some examples uh, that we've used in the past Okay, these are used to promote not only uh, the ease of moving these units around, but also it cuts down on vibration uh, and therefore adds safety as well as um, it simply cuts down on the attenuation or the noise that would be created. 400.7 B attachment plugs. When cords are used in accordance with 400.7a, 3, 6, and 8, it shall be energized from an outlet or the cord connector body and have an attachment plug. There are often times when I'll ask, uh, I'll have a guy that'll ask me, 
is it possible that I could put in a garage door opener and cut off the plug end and wire it directly? Well, certainly anything is possible, but that's definitely frowned upon because uh, your Article 400 specifically addresses scenarios like that. Uh, if it's a flexible cord connector that's supposed to have a plug, it's got to have a plug on the end. Period. 400.8. Use is not permitted. Flexible cords should not be used this way. Very straightforward. As a sub for fixed wiring of a structure. So it's not supposed to be permanently wired. You're not supposed to run it through holes and walls, ceilings, floors including drop ceilings. Shouldn't be run through windows or attached to the structure at all unless it's compliant with 368.56 which says uh, that it's going to deal with uh, cords and cables as its primary uh, goal. Concealed by walls, floors, and ceilings. Not supposed to be in raceways or where it's possible um, going uh, that it could be subject to damage. Okay, these are some examples. This is in a drop ceiling. It's just laying on top of the ceiling tile. Somebody lifts that tile off, they're going to take one in the noodle from that little box there. Hey, okay, here we've got one coming out through a window. One guy looked at that and said, is that uh, CSST or flexible gas pipe? No, that's a big old drop cord. 400.83 prohibits this. 400.82 prohibits this. Uh, this was actually done at a, near uh, at a dear relative of mine's house to wire in their ceiling fan by a local contractor. 400.9 splicing. Flexible cords should be used only in continuous unspliced or tapped lengths and in accordance with 400.7a. 14 gauge and larger cord repair shall be permitted. Okay, so for those of you guys that thought that you just had to cut your cords up and toss them away because they're damaged, listen to this. 14 gauge and larger cord repair shall be permitted as long as the installation, outer qualities, and usage characteristics of the original cord are maintained. Now, a lot of that's going to be up to whether or not the inspector feels that it has been maintained. And then also, are you using listed um, devices to reattach or to repair your cord with? Okay, here's some examples of a cord repair. Okay, we're putting a new end on here. 400.10, pull at joints and terminals. Common sense is going to tell you that you want to make sure that you've got something meant to keep the stress and strain off the flexible cords. Okay, this is going to keep the tension off the cord, but it's also going to keep uh, the tension off of the equipment that is connected to or the parts as well. Okay, here's some examples of some items that are used to cut down on tension. Probably one of the more common ones right here. 406.4, general installation of receptacles. These requirements shall be done in accordance with Part 3 of Article 210, which we addressed earlier in the program. 406.4a, grounding type. Except for what you find in 406d, 15, 20 amp, branch circuit receptacles shall be the grounding type. 406.4b to be grounded. Okay, that's the actual title of this section. Receptacles as well as cord connectors that have equipment grounding conductor contacts must be connected to an equipment grounding conductor. Very, very explicit in its explanation. Okay, still in 406.4, C, methods of grounding. The equipment grounding conductor of the receptacle 
and cord connectors shall be connected to the equipment grounding conductor of the circuit that is supplying the receptacle or cord connector. The branch circuit wiring method shall provide an equipment grounding conductor for the receptacle. Very, very important. See what it says there. The branch circuit wiring method shall provide an equipment grounding conductor for the receptacle. Very, very important to remember that in some certain situations. four hundred six dot four D replacements replacements must be done in accordance with four hundred six dot four D one through six arc fault circuit interrupters and ground fault circuit interrupters shall be installed in readily accessible locations okay we're gonna look at one through six here grounding type if there's a grounding means in the receptacle enclosure already, you have to use a grounded receptacle in the replacement. D1 has to be in, in accordance with 250.130C. Four hundred six point four D2, non-grounding type. Where there is currently no grounding conductor in the receptacle, enclosure you must comply with a non-grounding receptacles can be replaced with another non-grounded receptacle remember we want to label it B non-grounding receptacles can be replaced with a GFCI receptacle as long as it's marked words given here in the NEC no equipment ground and C Non-grounding receptacles can be replaced with a grounding type receptacle that is supplied through a GFCI and marked no equipment ground. Four oh six four D three ground fault circuit interrupters shall be provided where required elsewhere in this code. Exception, where the enclosure will not physically fit a new GFCI receptacle, you can put in a new version of the existing receptacle where GFCI is already provided and the receptacle is marked both GFCI protected and no equipment ground. Okay, remember, key words here where GFCI is already protected on the circuit. 4064D4, arc fault circuit interrupters. Where AFCI is required, the receptacle shall be one of the following. A listed AFCI receptacle, a receptacle already protected by a listed AFCI receptacle on that circuit, or a receptacle protected by an AFCI breaker. Remember, the replacement of the receptacle has to either be a listed receptacle, AFCI, a receptacle that's already protected by the AFCI receptacle that's on that circuit, or it's got to be on a circuit that's protected by an AFCI breaker. 406D41 became effective 1-1-2014 according to the National Electric Code on page 282 in case you're interested. 5 deals with tamper resistant receptacles. They must be provided where required by other sections of the code. 40612 is one of those areas. Tamper resistant receptacles. Tamper resistant receptacles shall be installed in accordance with 40612 A through C. And that's a new section in the code book. 40612 
tamper resistant receptacles. Again, 40612 tamper resistant uh, receptacles shall be installed in accordance with 40612A through C, and my example here is just A in dwelling units. In all areas specified in 21052 that have, so remember, this is all of your requirements uh, your countertop requirements, your dwelling unit ex uh, requirements in general, living room, everything. All areas specified in 21052 that have 15 amp and 20 amp 125 volt receptacles, you shall use listed tamper resistant receptacles. Period.